All right. Good day. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to another Live the Fuel show. So today I'm bringing on, I'm excited by this. I'm bringing on obviously another new guest co-host. Anybody who's been following this show for over five years knows that's my style. That's my format. For newer listeners, a reminder, the tagline for the show is we fuel your health, your business, and your lifestyle. These are three domains that I key in as a success tip for life, for business, anything. You got to balance these three areas of life. So my guest co-host tonight is going to help us dig probably at the core, mostly around health, but I have a feeling this will align with other areas, our other domains. But let me give you a quick background on the guy. I actually have fun with this terminology. He's a citizen scientist. I think more of us at the health geek level like myself probably should start calling ourselves that. <laughs> anyway, but he's an independent researcher. He's an author. I've got two of his books right here. Again, ladies and gentlemen, you'll be able to find these on Amazon, but the Mitochondriac Manifesto and the Gut Brain Secrets. So he had kind enough to send these to me. I'm still consuming them because it's that type of book or type of books that you want to slow down and maybe go back over a chapter or two, really digest it. He's hitting deep. He's hitting heavy. For those of you that are longtime listeners, if you remember way back in the day, Dr. Jack Cruz, all right, he's the guy who taught me about mitochondria. He's the one to talk to me about these power plants within our cells. He opened my brain up wider than I cared to really plan for. <laughs> uh, so without further ado, I want to dive right in. He's got a lot to share today. We're going to actually create a part one, part two for his topics, because there's a lot to digest. So without further ado, sir, the Mito man himself, Randy Lee, welcome to the show. Hi, Scott. How you doing? Yeah, I'm doing great. Thanks for uh, making the time. And thanks for letting me dive in before we hit record today and say, hey, man, I think this content has so much to be reviewed. We're going to have to go two parts. I, I think it's just a no brainer. I'm glad you're willing to do it uh, because our listeners should plan for that. Like when they finish this episode today, be prepared for a second follow-up that's going to dig even deeper and answer some more questions. Does that sound fair for your content? Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Well, you're the guest co-host. This is a two-way conversation for those new listeners out there. So let's dive in, man. You have been a little bit busy. You might care a little bit about mitochondria. You might care a little bit about gut health. Uh, we're fellow food geeks, nutrition geeks, but overall health, I mean, like I said, if we want to tie it back to Jack Cruz, right? Like He's one of your biggest influencers as far as your research, right? Absolutely. He's the godfather of the mitochondriac movement. There you go. Boom. <laughs> Everyone acknowledges that. Yeah. yeah. He was the first one to taught me about mitochondriacs, which is basically his followers, like the people who follow his content, the knowledge he shared over the years, et cetera. I mean, my God, he's, he's opened me up to, I didn't know what blue blocking glasses were back in the day. I didn't understand uh, the impacts of EMF frequencies until that episode and beyond. He helped me redirect and bring in a lot of other health influencers like yourself to bring up more and more topics over the years as we continue to dig deeper into this. And I think a lot of people need to understand that, I mean, just the term mitochondria, I think has been thrown around a lot more now than it ever has been. And that's very exciting. Would you agree? Would you disagree? Or maybe it's not being thrown around enough. <laughs> Uh, probably, uh, rolling out exactly the way it kind of needs to, where okay. the people that, uh, have some sort of, uh, health issue, uh, something going on in their life, they can trace the source of their problems back to mitochondria in some way, because almost everything goes through energy and the way mitochondria produce energy for the body. So, yeah. Um, so how do you, it, how, how do you simplify that? I mean, obviously I've got the books I've already worked with Jack. I mean, over the years, I love everybody's different perspective on it, but I always just simplified it as power plants in your cell, man, everything impacts them. And if you can find a way to, you know, fuel, so to speak, the mitochondria at the core of what it's was meant to be, like you're basically have hacked your entire body, your brain, everything you're performing at the peak performance that you should have been with your entire life. Well, here's a good example, <laughs> Scott. Here, here's yeah. a good example where um, you have a lot of people have health problems and then they go, well, maybe I should try going vegan. Maybe I should try going keto or paleo mm -hmm. or, or carnival, some right? other therapy yeah. or intervention in their life. And what they don't realize is uh, the food you eat and different exposures like light in your environment go through mitochondria. So you could be doing something thinking you're th that's the solution, but it's being influenced more by mitochondria and your circadian rhythms. So 
you we have a limited amount of knowledge in your space and you uh, hone in and try to correct the problem, but you didn't locate the source and you didn't understand the problem. So you're going in exactly the wrong direction or at least an inefficient way to solve your problem. I'm guilty of that. I'll drive right now. I'll, I'll, I'll vibe with you on that. Once I started learning and digging deeper into mitochondrial health, obviously the next logical step was also to understand the impacts of circadian rhythm as well. Uh, and then I've always been a nutrition geek. Like I'm, I'm 45 years old now and I'm at a sweet spot between 185 and 190, which my firefighting weight years ago, over a decade ago at 32 or th my early thirties was like 190 to 195. And I called that fluffy weight. I was, I mean, obviously I was hiking in the mountains 16 hours a day fighting wildfires. So I was fit but it wasn't lean, defined, cut. I call it a fluffy weight because it's whatever the fire camps fed us. And let's, let's be real. These are funded by the federal government and your tax dollars. The food was questionable to say the least, besides the fact that I was eating MREs and other things. So uh, yeah, I think a lot of us are guilty of what you just hinted at. We start saying, well, great. I'll go vegan or I'll go carnivore, or I'll go keto or whatever the current viral thing is being talked about. And I've been through all those protocols. and. A lot of us get overwhelmed. They're like, whoa, okay, well, maybe I got to do everything. Maybe I got to buy the blue blockers and uh, start getting those uh, the screen nettings over my bed to block the frequencies. And then I'm going to fix my nutrition and my diet. And then people just get so overwhelmed, they don't know where to go. And they just give it all up and go back to eating manufactured processed garbage. And they wonder why they're toxic and unhealthy. And it's basically a human hot mess. That's my little term, human hot mess. <laughs> Yeah, that's why that health education is so important. You need to be able to understand where things fit and how powerful they are so you can selectively choose because you can't do everything. It's just impossible. No. And you'd, you'd go broken and insane before you. <laughs> so oh, yeah. So you have to um, know where things fit in the priority and what you can and cannot do. And what you like your what your children, for example, might put up with or not, <laughs> and you need to be able to explain why they're doing it. Uh, you know, give them some background on. So yeah, I think we all need to be uh, our own health bosses. We need to take charge of our own health. So that requires education, a little proactivity, you know, a little commitment. And well, uh, I'll have to go back to your term of citizen scientist. I mean, that's how I started geeking out. Now, granted, the podcast really gave me a leg up over a lot of my friends and colleagues because I get to hang out on a microphone with somebody like you and just absorb all the content along with the thousands of listeners out there. What's well, like, I'm learning with them. And that's what I love about the microphone. If I hadn't had this podcast, well, before I, I launched my show, what was I doing? I was listening to audiobooks and listening to other podcasts, consuming content, taking accountability. Here's my key thing, little statement, taking personal accountability for my health. And to your point, right? If you're a family person, great. Take accountability for your family, your children, the next generation, all of that falls under the responsibility of an adult and being a parent or otherwise. But I think a lot of us don't realize the importance of taking accountability. How, how do you talk about that with everything that you're researching and figuring out? Accountability. Um, hmm. That's a uh... It's a big word for what you're working challenging on. Challenging <laughs> conversation for a lot of people because, you know, it's it's actually a substitute for a personal responsibility. You know, oh. <laughs> responsibility and accountability is not uh, something people um, uh, are uh, totally interested in. Uh, you know, accentuating in their life. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Being yeah. responsible, aka accountable, depending on how you want to go with that. Yeah, no, but we've I, not but seen I, a lot of that in the past couple of years. And we could go off on a whole tangent on that. Uh, but obviously, with what you're working on right now, I think a big focus for us is it doesn't matter the keto, the carnivore, the vegan, the grocery stores versus local source sourcing locally. Uh, how many ingredients are in the food you're eating? You know, is it whole? Is it pure? Is it uh, paleo, right? Paleo was the big viral thing. Paleolithic era foods, et cetera. All these terms. But I think if you had to sum it all up with what a lot I was researching, what I know you're going to be passing through uh, with your background and everything you've already kind of outlined for me before we start the show today is this impact on food quality, right? What are the inputs and outputs, all of that? So I ha how long ago did you start jumping in on this little theme? Well, years ago, I was uh, I had a lot of 
friends with ADD and autism. So I started researching gut brain health and getting into uh, Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride's work and Donna Gates's. And um, at the time, it was fairly new material, uh, gut and brain health, how um, gut dysbiosis and the microbiome that's upset in some way contributes okay. to psychological disorders. Yep. And so I went down the rabbit hole and investigated all these different uh, effects, the inputs and the outputs. So how farming practices like factory farming produces either great quality stuff or what it's a uh, factory farming today is corrupting the soil microbiome and the mm -hmm. soil food web. And at that, when you do that, plants can't produce these higher level compounds, uh, higher level nutrients that correlate with taste. And so when you taste food, that's not, um, tasty and flavorful, <laughs> it's devoid of nutrients. Mm -hmm. um, so I investigated um, detoxification, autoimmunity, um, ADD, autism, uh, hydration, all these different things that uh, by accident, I discovered that all these things kind of congregate and they, um, the, they meet around food quality, which is basically nutrients and toxins to put it simply, nutrient density and toxin exposure, which mostly comes from uh, our farming practices. True. I can tell you, I grew up on a farm. We, and I've dug into this too, and you'll appreciate this. It's like, if you go back only, only, a, only a few decades, um, the level of false fertilization, I like to call it, was not needed. We, you, if an animal mm -hmm. craps on the ground, there's your fertilization, right? Um, thanks to great marketing and great sales pros from these fertilizer chemical companies, they were led to believe, you know, that, oh, well, here, just put this stuff on the field and you'll yield more crops. What they didn't realize was, you know, tons of nitrogen and everything else you're dumping into the soils, you're throwing off its natural microbiome balance and you're killing off a lot of healthy bacteria. Even I know that. I'm not a scientist, <laughs> but yet we still do it. <laughs> There's still thousands of acres being treated that way. It's a myth. You don't need fertilizer when you have, when you grow in, uh, ancestral farming practices mm -hmm. and, uh, that and tilling and herbicides, pesticides, they create the, uh, they deplete these, not only do they deplete the soil, but they deplete the food of nutrients. So what yeah. we've done is let's say 80 years ago, there used to be this bell curve. And we, uh, if you chopped off the, t the upper third, all food used to be in the 65th to 85th percentile. But today, you know, according to us FDA, we depleted all our soil. And so you chop off the bottom third and all the food you get is in the 15th to 40th percentile. And there's virtually none at the top. Hmm. And that's where chronic disease comes that, that comes from. That's where uh, psychological disorders, um, all kinds of different, uh, major, um, problems come from in our society. I agree. I mean, the human body, especially our brain is, is profoundly amazing. Uh, but if we're not, I'll use my keyword, if we're not fueling the body, we're not fueling the brain, right. You're going to have problem after problem after problem. And if we keep doing it over and over again, back to your point, introducing toxins and toxicity, you're compounding the problem. So it's bad enough you're eating crappy food or crappy fuel, right? Uh, it's like, I, I, I hear I'm in Northeast Pennsylvania, moving into winter time. What is a common thing that I grew up with when I had a car as a kid was they said, oh, make sure you buy uh, dry gas, these little bottles of dry gas from the auto parts store, auto parts store, because in the winter time, because of snow and excessive rain, and maybe fuel companies are doing it on purpose, the fuel might be a little bit more watered down, so to speak. There's water in the fuel, and they say, well, that'll affect your engine's performance. And if you put the dry gas in, that helps pull the moisture out, and you get just pure petroleum, you know, gasoline. And they said, obviously, so I think about this: like we're watering down the fuel coming into our bodies that we need to be running at peak capacity. So we have toxic food. We have low nutrient density foods like you're talking about. And we wonder why the body's not performing. It's not healing correctly. We're not, we have all these brain issues you're talking about ADD. Heck, um, you ever hear the Charlie foundation? Mm, no. 
Remember the old eighties movie airplane? It was a comedy. Yeah. Okay. Lo- love it. So that movie director, he had a son that had massive, uh, his name was Charlie, last name Abrams. So the director was Abrams. But Charlie, the tra- I'm actually bringing it up right now. I'll screen share real quick just for the video. But it's Charlie F- Foundation for Ketogenic Therapies, right? So this this guy realized, wait a minute, while he they were getting ready to drill a hole in his son's head because he was having epileptic seizures hundreds a day. Then he went into the medical library at the hospital while he was stressed out and he saw books about ketogenic therapies that are like decades old. And he's like, wait, why aren't we trying this with food? They said, yeah, that may work. (laughs) And they're like, he's like, wait a minute. He's like, you're willing to drill a hole into my kid's head or cut open his head to, to take a piece of his brain out, but you're not willing to at least try food first. Right. Like that's crazy (laughs) stuff, but that's our medical profession. So he, that, that I love promoting that, that charity because his son, they said his son would never become a full functioning kid, yada, yada, yada. And obviously they've cleaned up how he was sourcing the food throughout his childhood, uh, went very hardcore ketogenic therapy. And now this kid has grown and actually is a teacher. So he's now performing and doing a career that they said he'll never be able to do. They said he was supposed to be permanently, you know, mentally challenged the rest of his life. And they fixed it with food. So there's something to said about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nutrient density can solve a lot of problems. And uh, that's what we're on the cusp of right now. Yeah. yeah. And it's tragic, right? It's like that little quick story about a charity. And the only reason why I knew about that is uh, one of my old clients and a good friend of mine, Vinny Toyrich, was the trainer to the stars out in LA. And he put out a couple of great documentary films called Fat, a documentary, The Truth About Healthy Fats. But they talked about not just ketogenic and the fats, but everything we're talking about right now, right? It's also, what's the quality? You know, what are you putting in? Is it just, yes, you could say, great, I'm going keto. Well, great, I'll have, you know, extra virgin olive oil. There's a whole, it's a great book on that called Extra Virginity. I don't know if you ever heard about that one. Mm. It's the whole truth, right? In line with what you're talking about, the whole truth behind the the, uh, olive oil industry. If you have legit pure olive oil, that is a great source of fats. Doesn't matter if you're a vegan, vegetarian, carnivore, whatever, right? It's olive oil. Great source of healthy fats. And actually has a decent heat tolerance for cooking. But the problem is in this country, our wonderful government that overlooks our food allows that to be cut by over like 40%. So they're putting seed oil, <laughs> right? Yeah, laugh. It's, and it, this Crazy. is the sad thing, right? So we're now saying, oh, well, hey, said manufacturer. Oh, it's okay. You can add in seed oils. Well, the Italians, they call that, basically that translates to lamp oil. Uh, it, it, like They actually say like, no, you don't do that because if you superheat seed oils, all kinds of side effects come out of that. So it's crazy that we allow to do this in our own country. And then they can still put on the bottle that is 100% extra virgin olive oil. That's just one example of poor food, toxic food, inflammatory foods. When people are thinking that they're trying to do something right and they're trying to be healthy, like, oh, I'll start buying olive oil. They don't even know that most of the stuff on the store shelves here in this country is tainted and has been blended with poor oils to help them make more profits. So great book. (laughs) Blows my mind that can... They can say 100% uh, Italian olive oil and yeah, you know, all these things. Spanish or whatever other types of. Now you're saying they can put seed oils in. Yes. Oh gosh, that's. Uh, that's now, 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 why does that shock you, Randy? What What is your concerns <laughs> about seed oils? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think if you um, if you were to eliminate or eliminate the problem of omega six to omega three ratios, you would reduce a lot of chronic inflammation throughout. That's like a baseline corruption of, of everyone's systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, well, uh, uh, another great, see, I know you're working with a ton of doctors and researchers now, and feel free to start name dropping yours. I'm just going off of my podcast world. You ever hear of Dr. Kate Shanahan? Yeah. Okay. So she's been on the show. I aired her back in July of 2020 when she released the fat burn fix, but she's an expert of bringing to light the impacts of fats and oils around obesity, cytokine storms, all these negative health impacts. But her big theme is the impacts of seed oils, because if you superheat those things, oh, not good, people, not good. People worry about the trans fats and those fast foods. Well, stop eating fast food anyway. (laughs) It's a whole different subject, right, Randy? But the seed oils Mm -hmm. are toxic to us. So toxic. So, and that, and that, let alone how they're being grown 
what's being sprayed on them back to your core point what's in the dirts you know the dirt that they're being grown in like uh what's one of the big seed oils it's not even a real plant so to speak like people think it's actually a regular crop it's being grown here in pennsylvania i can't think of it right now it's not sunflower oil it's a different one i'll think about uh, it rape i can't, I can't rape, even yeah rape, you rape seed oil it's translated to rape seed oil but i'm just trying to get the name of the plant canola canola yeah People are like, oh, canola oil, that, that, that's, that's a plant. I'm like, <laughs> I was sounds like, really? like a normal thing. Sounds good. Yeah. I mean, no, bad. And <laughs> you go down to any baking aisle in a grocery store in this country and what's sitting there? Canola oil and a lot soybean of soybean oil. oil. Soybean. Oh, wait, wait, Randy. So is, is soybean bad? <laughs> Soybean's horrible for your endocrine system. You got estrogen mimics and all these kinds of different upset, you know. People are going to hate me for saying this, but I heard um, one of my uh, gurus that I listen to a lot, and uh, recently she said, basically, um, homosexuality and gender confusion has its source in upset hormone levels in the womb, and soybean is probably one of the biggest contributors to that. If that is true... That's a logical source of, uh, you know, so many people have this uh, asexuality or, or altered sure. sexuality that, you know, that would just be horrible to go through life with, uh, you know, well, we wanting, have the science wanting a sex that. change operation and then like yeah. doing it and then feeling that, oh, shoot, that wasn't the actual problem. I don't feel any better. I still feel um, not comfortable in my own skin. Well, that's like before we started the show, Dr. Anthony Jay, I told you about him. He's uh, the geneticist who wrote the book Estrogeneration, and it's the impacts of plastics. But what you're just discussing also is impacts on our natural hormonal alignments in the body. Like genetically, we're made a certain way, and I'm not getting into this whole woke era thing. It's just, okay, there's genetics and there's that's it. Like, right? And then there's hormones, right? But the, peep, to your point, people don't realize consuming soy in the quantities we do today and the plastics that we're surrounded with, all that toxicity is severely impacting hormonal alignments. There are women that are uh, doing their the women things at a whole different cycle. Like their, their natural cycles are completely thrown off or it's now happening in their 50s and 60s when they shouldn't be, all these variables. And that's just on the female front, let alone, and they talk about how you know, man boobs, all these types of things that get developed in men because of excessive, you know, hormone misalignment, everything you're talking about. And yes, we can go down that path on, on the, on the sexual orientation thing. That's a whole other podcast there, but that's the problem. People don't realize that they're reading the wrong content or they think they're reading, you know, science, but it's fluff science. Like how, how do you talk to the fluff science? I bring this up because here's something fun for you. Just for fun. I Googled on WebMD right? Because there's a trustworthy platform. <laughs> right here, they're saying canola oil is healthy for you. One of the best oils for heart health. Canola oil has less saturated fat than any other oil commonly used in the US. Cutting down on saturated fats helps cut your cholesterol levels. Now, the issue with that statement right there is it's completely wrong. I've had multiple heart experts on this show, and they've all confirmed that saturated fat is not unhealthy for you. And that is not what's contributing to heart health issues. It's actually the opposite of this. Like, don't eat canola oil, I would just said. So here we're talking about this poor data, lacking science. A lot of stuff is not uh, double-blind studied or no, no actual, you know, legitimate deep dive research. A lot of it's that surface level, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, Randy? That surface level science, I call it. The, uh, they're just Big running science. numbers. What's that? The fake, the fake science. science. <laughs> yeah. But um, propaganda. What's, what's, what's the kind of research where they just run a bunch of sequences and, 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 and uh, equations based on uh, survey data? That's um, epidemiological, epigenetic type of stuff, right? So is that the word I'm looking for? Uh, no, no. Um, yeah, I know what you mean. It, the, the word escapes me. Yeah, uh, it's escaping me right now. But the, the point here is, People who do start going down this path to find data like you've researched, it's hard for them to find it, right? There's not enough legitimate resources, or if there is, it takes a lot longer to find influencers like Dr. Jack Cruz or like the doctors and researchers you found, or like the people I've just name dropped on this show that I've had on my show. It took me years to start tracking these people down because I started, to, like the point I made earlier, 
we started taking accountability. I started taking responsibility for my health. I don't just go to a regular <clears throat> MD and just expect them to give me the answer because a lot of the answer is, hey, take this drug. No. <laughs> Why would I take a drug? I call it that a pharmaceutical Band-Aid. A Band-Aid meaning it's not healing anything. You're just covering something up. You haven't found the root cause. And that's one thing that ties me way back to Dr. Jack Cruz and all, everything you, you've put in your book, uh, Mit Mitochondriac Manifesto, right? Is that, dude, root cause is a great term that everybody needs to start researching <laughs> and understand, right? <laughs> and your best defense against uh, misinformation and uh, miseducation is personal, personal knowledge. Yeah. And you have to have an, a good understanding of some of these things, to, even at a surface level, to defend yourself against all this propaganda that's been just, it's everywhere now. And you got these people that not only do they don't know what they don't know, but they're believing in exactly the wrong thing. Hmm. So all their foundational beliefs are based on lies. <laughs> it's yeah. that's, it's really the fake, the fake science. Yeah. The it's, fluff. Uh, yeah. It is really uh, disturbing to watch. So how are you and the, and your colleagues? Cause I know you're not alone in this, but how are you guys attacking this? Because I'm kind of setting the stage for our part two, where we're going to get like, you know, into some really solid, answers that you can share at this time, so to speak, but like, how have you been able to, you and your team and your, and your fellow colleagues, what are you doing about it? I guess. Right. That's why did we're, you, that's why we're having did, you on the did show. You, what did, you, did you want to get into the food quality discussion? You're the co-host, my friend. So. Okay. Well, um, I know it's a deep dive, so that's why we're, that's yeah. why we're doing multiple parts. <laughs> okay. Well, in researching what to say about gut brain secrets, I discovered quite by accident that it all revolves around food quality, meaning okay. nutrient density and, and toxins. And I discovered guys that are already working on this and it's not just uh, some proposal or something that's way off uh, in the distance that they're going to try to put together. They've been working on this for years and it's well underway. Okay. So at this point, it's almost inevitable. They, the powers that be could delay it for a couple of years, but it's imminent at this point. And so they by have that enough I, momentum? By that, I mean the entire food supply is about to change forever. It's about to be receive a massive upgrade. And we're not talking uh, improving nutrition 10, 50%, 100%. We're talking, we're going back to our ancestral uh, results. So ancestral farming practices are ancient, uh, ancient results. The back to the time when all food was nutritious, all food was organic. Mm -hmm. And so you didn't have to worry about it. And of course, a lot of these problems that we see in the world didn't exist back then. That's a big switch to flip though. I mean, yes, I've started seeing some farms. They're no, they're no longer, they, what they call it, cracking the earth. They're realizing that the plowing uh, was actually opening up the earth and killing the natural microbes and, and the microbiome. Like it's better off just to leave it the way it is and continue planting and letting that, um, what they call it, root depth. Uh, like plants naturally supposed to have roots that go like feet upon feet deep, like even grass, something as simple as field grass. And they don't because we've just plowed the crap out of it and over farmed it and toxified it. Well, tilling mostly um, disturbs the fungal hyphae. They create, uh, there's beneficial fungi in the soil that uh, tie the soil. They create, uh, they break it up mm -hmm. and they also tie it together with like their own little cabling to keep yeah. it in place. So water doesn't wash all the microbes away and um, the soil can be aerated properly and, uh, the air, uh, the microbes have something to breathe, you know, have air to breathe. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So the entire food supply is about to change and nutrient density. Um, I've been examining, I've been analyzing this situation and in the first two to three years from this point, it's, uh, we're, we're about to turn uh, the year to 2023, the first two years, you're not going to see much. So it's going to be stuff that's going on behind the scenes where these uh, technologies are gaining traction, which we can talk about in part two. But at year three, four, five, and the, that five-year period after the first uh, two or three years, 
the nutrient density of food is going to climb aggressively where probably in a two to three year period, you're going to see food reaching its natural ceiling of what it used to be when we, uh, with ancestral farming practices. Wow. And then the time after that, the next five to 10 years, you're going to see farmers challenging the full genetic potential of foods of crops Hmm. where, you know, you have a normal pumpkin that's between 10 and 30 pounds where how big is the world record breaking pumpkin 20 it's over 2500 2500 yeah. pounds so we know that nutrient densities vary uh just what we can see right now is um factory farmed uh produce can be way down let's say at uh, one to ten units and the best stuff that we can grow now is 50, 100, it's 200 times what the stuff we might buy in a grocery store is. Is that like hydroponic type stuff or like testing or? Well, it's, it's, uh, uh, they've tested a lot of different things, but they, they've uh, discovered that organic is generally no better than, uh, in nutrient value than the average. It's actually below oh, that. Average. I agree with. Yeah. You're paying for a badge. <laughs> and you have to trust it. That's that's the whole system that we need to overturn and and uh, get into something new. Yeah. Is you put your trust and your faith in a label, whether that's non-GMO project verified or um, biodynamic, uh, hydroponic, greenhouse grown, all these different permaculture, these different things. Mm-hmm. All these things will kind of go away in the future, and everything will be based on its merit. It'll be judged on its merit and it will be, um, they will be taking all these technologies and uh, using them and they will actually be able to see results. So I don't want to skip over that one point. You kind of dropped a big bomb earlier. So you're saying that within three to five years of when they ripped the lid off on on this project, that you can flip around the nutrient density and quality that relatively quickly? Yes. And that's uh, surprising because everything else I'm reading and studying and geeking out on, they're like, we've, you know, we've screwed our, our land and it's going to take, it's going to take a lifetime you know, to rebuild. Um, and this is exciting to me because it's nice to know that this is possible, you know, with the right people involved. Uh, if you switch away from factory farming and get back to ancestral practices, you can, you can replete the soil wow. and it generally does not need to be, um, uh, amended yearly, you can just uh, uh, remediate the soil and get it back to the way it was. And it may last for 20 years, 10, 20 years. So you seldom need to do that. That's quite motivational. But, I'm excited yeah, by that. <laughs> but you need, the, you need the life in the soil. You need basically the bacteria and the fungi to solubilize all the sand, silt, clay, and uh, unlock all the stuff that's it's in the soil and it's in the dirt right now, but it needs to be solubilized and so it's mobile, mm-hmm. and it can work its way through the um, the different uh, hyper. I don't want to say hypertrophic levels, but I'm not sure if that's the right word. Bacteria, fungi, insects, worms, all the way up to birds and mammals. Okay. You need to have all those present to to maximize the nutritional value, and. Uh, Unfortunately, all our produce right now is uh, almost all of it's lacking. And you can tell by the taste because the human biology is well uh, attuned to understand what's good for you and what's not. Mm -hmm. And these higher level compounds are something like 20 to 50,000 nodes, elements, and it's very complex. You need bacteria to assemble that. Wow. I mean, that I agree with because I remember reading a study over a decade ago, which was when I was really starting to go down the health nut route. Uh, it was, they said something like you could take a bowl of, or, you know, quote, I had to do air quotes here, organic spinach, for example. And you're like, well, one, that farm supposedly paid the government for their organic testing and they're supposedly meeting the standards. And then as long as they keep paying that annual fee to the government for the organic badge, they can continue putting it on their packaging. But to your point, right, organic doesn't necessarily mean that it's healthier or more nutrient dense. Hopefully, they're holding themselves accountable, and they are. But it didn't matter. They did a test, and they said, listen, a bowl of spinach, this was 10 years ago, 
they said compared to 15, 20 years before that, you would need, I think back then they said you needed nine bowls of spinach, like nine servings of spinach to be equal to one serving at that time because of the lack of nutrient density, because of the degradation of the soil and the nutrients that were going into that plant. And that was a decade ago when I read that study. So they were already seeing a lack of, of strength and health in the food. You can perform miracles when you have extremely high nutrient density. And once you change your the way you think about um, nutrients, well, I mean, we, t we tend to think, oh, I can get a little higher bump from eating organic or you know, just going away from processed food, going to uh, whole foods, mm -hmm. um, cooking all your own food, um, buying these certain labels or buying local is actually a good, a good shortcut to make sure you have higher nutrient density, but it's still... Um, you still have to trust to some extent. You still got to look at the farming practices that are happening there. Yep. Yeah, but but you can basically perform miracles when you get to those super high levels. Like, imagine you had optimal nutrient density. Imagine if there was no such thing as obesity or cancer mm. or diabetes. Okay, here's a big one. Imagine if there was no such thing as chronic inflammation. <laughs> Which again, chronic inflammation. What I is, just said. Yeah, that, it's a direct uh, tie to disease. They should be shaking their head in disbelief. Like, what uh, What the heck are you talking about? Oh, yeah. Imagine if there was no autism and high nutrient density will reverse all these epigenetic changes to our uh, genetic lineage. So you can get back to all the ancestral results that we used to have, you know, where all these chronic diseases were rare. Yes. That's what is going to happen. I'm not saying it's, it may happen. I'm saying it is happening already. You just, you can't see the results of it yet. It's one thing that racks my brain is, oh, and by the way, the, the word just popped back in my head. It was epidemiology, not epigenetics, right? So epidemiological yeah. studies, but it's like trying to explain this and open people's minds up. And I get it. We're all at a different place in the timeline. So even when people hear this today from you and I rapping and then going on to part two, where we get deeper it's still going to make people's brains hurt, so to speak, right? Like like when I first met Dr. Jack Cruz, I was like, oh my God, like holy, holy moly. <laughs> but the point here is that people are just a different place in the timeline. It's going to take time to unlock their ability to fathom this. And when I try to explain what I know to other people, they still look at me like I'm crazy and they can't fathom what you're talking about. I'm like, guys, like if you just go back 50, 60 years, our disease rate was way less. But yet you think whatever we're doing now is better. Like, well, if it was better, why is disease higher? And now we have even new diseases. Like, no, we're not going in the right direction. So that's why I'm excited what you're bringing to the forefront here, because I'm like, we need to stop. We need to hit the reset switch, you know? And that's a big switch, as I, as I referenced, to flip uh, that you guys are talking about right now. Well, that sounds like it's doable. Well, here's what's going on, Scott, is these guys, the, the would-be rulers of the world, they see this big pool or river of something flowing by and they they go oh there's money flowing by or labor or energy or what have you a natural resource mm -hmm. and they go oh start scooping it out they grab a bucket and start scooping pretty soon they create a pipeline to their vaults and their mansions and before long they go hey we should dam up this river and control all the flow through it and put on, you know, taxes and regulations and certifications and all this. So they control every facet of society. That's, that's all the systemic problems here in a yes. nutshell, every single thing. And, uh, you know, diamonds are a good example. The De Beers corporation over hundred years ago decided to monopolize this and make a fairly common commodity. You know, diamonds are not nearly as rare as we think they are. And, exert monopoly control over the entire marketplace so they can control the prices and limit the supply. But what do we see now? Uh, money supplies like that, mm -hmm. the food supply, entertainment, everything. It, and I think it's, it's reached a level where it's unsustainable. Human I totally health, agree with you. Human health has gone, gone over the guardrail and we're now in free fall. Human fertility, cancer, all these things are now unsustainable. And yeah. we see it with, uh, you know, the Japanese population so aging, and China's at even rolling back their one-child policy. The U.S. is now. I think that uh, human fertility has bottomed out, and I think we're past 
sustainable levels because it was low to begin with. And then yes. the COVID situation hit and now the stillbirths and infertility has skyrocketed. So we haven't even seen it in the stats yet, but I think the human replacement levels it was is underwater at this yes. point. I, I agree with you. And, and you're, you're hitting on a lot of powerful things because it's, it's all true. I mean, just look at this. It's like, well, and again, I'm not some foil hat wearing person, right? Let's just, this is common sense, ladies and gentlemen. It's like, okay, well, look at the billion dollar pharmaceutical companies. And then obviously the government's influence back and forth. Like, you know, they're shaking hands. This isn't, you don't need a foil hat. And it doesn't matter if you're, I don't, I don't get into politics or religion on the show. So it's like, you know, it's not blue versus red. It's like, okay, well, if the populace is sick, I don't want them to die, right? Because I still need labor. But if they stay relatively sick the rest of their lives, then they gotta they need some drugs. And if we just keep that circle flowing, back to your point, right? The river of money. Well, it's like, okay, it's all dammed up. So great. Oh, you're not feeling well? Go to a broken healthcare system, get your rubber stamp pharmaceutical band-aid, as I called it, the the, the drug. And then, oh, don't forget, you need another drug and then another drug in the next five, 10 years because you haven't improved your health at all. So now you got like three or four drugs and they all have side effects, but it's okay. We didn't kill you. Yet. That's why we know we went too far. We don't want to, we don't want to kill you, <laughs> but we're just going to keep you sick. So keep you sick to the end, end of time. And there's lots of money happening, but they don't realize it's something as simple as how they're fueling their body. It's just like what you put in this pie hole <laughs> is what you get out, right? So it's exciting that what you're dropping here because it can be that simple. It just takes a big flip of the switch. All that is changing. It's going to change. And it's actually, it takes a little bit of uh, digging into this to realize how many problems are solved when you have maximal nutrient density. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's not just the health effects or the farming effects or the environment. It's a, uh, a lot of, uh, political uh, influence, you know, it's, uh, it, it's families, it's relationships, it's spirituality, you know, all these things that, uh, they've effectively, we're living in broken systems yeah. is the, the end result. Broken system. control, broken systems. Yeah. Yeah. So all that is, will be, uh, a lot of it will be reversed with so, this movement that I'm talking about. I uh, apologize that we have to just kind of allude to it at this point, <laughs> but there's a, you know, it's, it's part of a longer conversation. And the, ring, the reason I bring it up is we need to start the conversation now because the early adopters will, uh, they'll get the benefits early on before it goes mainstream and they'll seek it out. So uh, my advice is to get educated on, on this, uh, topic of food quality and all the different things that go into it and all the different outcomes that result from it. Sure. I yeah, remind people all the time, like if you can find a better quality food source, do you even need as much per se food? Right. I mean, it's like, wait a minute. Ab absolutely. I right. have a more nutrient dense egg or I have a more nutrient dense steak or I have a more nutrient dense uh, sp uh spinach the bowl of spinach I was talking about earlier right it's like okay well we can finally reach a point where we were ancestrally where less was more we don't need these massive factory farming operations because the nutrient density is there mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's exciting we could we mm -hmm. could heal we could heal the world faster and more efficiently, more effectively, because, and why wouldn't, again, well, there's a lot of greed involved here, but why wouldn't most countries want to align on this initiative, heal their populace, heal their people, have a stronger labor force, have the birth rates improve, right? You would think we should be able to come together on this as a, as a species. Well, why do you think they don't? I already dropped that word greed. <laughs> I mean, all right. I mean, we've already we see it. We see it all over the world. In some countries, it's seen more easily than others. You know, you know, communism versus socialism versus capitalism, et cetera. You know, depending on the countries you're in. Like obviously, countries like China, North Korea, maybe they're not able to see it as obvious. Uh, but uh, let's just speak to the USA here, North America, Canada. We we all can see it. It's just, are you turning a blind eye to it, or are you willing to wake up? and realize that things could be done differently and to be done better. It's all about control. And mm -hmm. if you put people in fear and scarcity and dependence, they'll do anything you want. Yes. <laughs> you can control them. That's true. And that, 
and the food supply is the big one. It's uh, it's right up there with the money, the money supply. Well, look what happens when things go wrong. A blizzard ro rolls into a state or a city, right? Everybody rushes the grocery stores, and they all buy bread and milk for some reason. But anyway, I don't I don't consume either of those. Mm -hmm. But it's like, but to your, like uh, when the pandemic hit, the shutdowns hit, everybody was freaking out about how am I going to get my food, right? Because you need food to live. It's a basic necessity. It's a basic fundamental of life. But back to your point, well, like I wasn't worried. I already started working with my local farms around here. I just stocked up my freezers and or I, I set up those local relationships that I already had. Just, I just checked in. I'm like, hey, you guys, everything's good, right? Yeah, we're fine. Like I didn't freak out at all. I have no fear because I'm not dependent on broken systems. So mm -hmm. I'm probably... I'm probably not somebody that the uh, the control likes to know about. They don't. They don't. They don't like people like me and you. <laughs> <laughs> You're a misinformation agent, <laughs> apparently, or I'm just living my life to the fullest, which is all I tell people to do. Like, right? It's like uh, I'm just trying to share the information so people can unlock that chapter of their lives or restore that chapter for where like, some of us maybe already lived that way years ago and then didn't realize that it had been constricted and reduced to, to more control and realized, wait a minute, there's, you don't have to do that much to get back to that, which is kind of what I'm getting from here. Like this sounds like a big and cumbersome project, but also like, okay, sourcing stuff locally, working with local businesses and local farms, like that was not rocket science for me over the past five years. I just told everybody like, Hey, I'm going back to the way it was when I was a kid. That's all I did. And I just, I just started putting in the reps and figuring it out. I know that's harder to do in population dense cities and urban environments. Right? We know that's a part of an issue, but back to your point, if we could fix all the farming, the next logical step then is supply chain impacts and, and, and vice versa, right? We could start getting that nutrient dense foods back into even the po heavily populated cities. So getting stuff to the shelf in a much more healthy and, and nutrient dense uh, form. Well, we have some major assets in our favor. And one of those is uh, when you align your own self-interest, when you align like taste, for example, we all want stuff to taste better. And we're fighting price and convenience, of course. Sure. And we, we know that. So the alignment of everyone's motivation is actually what is I'm really excited about because all our motivations are going to be aligned in this process from taste to, you know, personal interest. Uh, if we all realize what kind of health impacts are produced from a nutrient poor food, then we realize what the solution is. We understand what we need to do from that point forward. And we can, uh, through a marketing effort, align all those interests. So these things happen naturally. You don't have to fight as much. True. Yeah. If you could find a, a smoother path, an easier flow. Cause again, you and I are both marketing guys. So I, I get that, mm -hmm. right? Advertising and marketing is much more relaxed. It's an easier flow process. It's not as cumbersome and ergo should not be as expensive either to, to get the word out quote, so to speak. So, mm -hmm. um, so on that note of communication and sharing and, and, and getting the word, all right. We hinted earlier, like this was, this was part one. This was to get everybody like primed, get their brains opened up. Uh, get you hopefully maybe if you're listening it's passionate about your your freaking food like the taste as simply as was randy said here that's just i want stuff to taste better and not done with a chemical or shellacking it in some kind of sugar alcohol right like <laughs> because we stripped the, all the nutrient density out or sources of healthy fats or whatever part of that conversation so so randy how would you set the stage here to bring this episode to a close to set the stage for what's going to happen next I would uh, bring your knowledge up, get ready for the coming uh, revolution, which I think is actually an understatement. Um, and Gut Brain Secrets actually has a lot of that. About three quarters of it is about food quality and, and these other things that are not generally talked about, like farming practices and environmental impact, um, about how ADD and autism uh, what they are biologically so you understand their source. Mm -hmm. So start learning about that and we'll uncover, we'll expose more of those solutions in a future episode. Oh, we definitely will. 
we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna, we're gonna rip the lid off on on episode two <laughs> or part two or whatever we're gonna we'll have to figure out a fun what fun little uh a title for that one because mm-hmm. uh, again the gut brain secrets copy you had sent me absolutely loved it uh the mitochondriac manifesto if people are looking for your brain to hurt a little bit more, definitely get that one. I mean, that's on Amazon right now. That, that's um, the future of medicine. <laughs> Gut brain yeah. secrets is kind of the current state yes. of the art. Yes. And it's true. People do not understand that. It's already been proven. There was it was like just three to five years ago, people were saying, Oh, there's no way that the brain is 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 connected to the stomach or you know, to to our digestive process. I'm like, but that's yeah. BS that they actually now have started calling it the second brain, so to speak, or maybe even the first brain, right? Because the gut biome is so crucial, so crucial to your overall health. Yeah, again, great books, people. And again, I myself still haven't technically fully read it from front to back because I've skipped ahead of some certain topics of chapters that I want to lead with myself and then went back and then do some double reads because I got to say, Randy, you could definitely tell you're a geek, sir. The, the, the citizen <laughs> scientist, because I was like, wait a minute, he just hit on that. Oh, hold on, I'm gonna go back. Let me just let me start that chapter over. Go back from start to finish again. Then I started dab- diving into my adult student, um, the uh, the skimming, the, the quick note taking memorization mm-hmm. techniques. And I'm like, wait a minute, now, now, now I'm doing the finger drag, and I'm, I'm like, I gotta hit those peeps. It's it's these are heavy reads, people, but in a good way. Uh, it's a. I would like to say right now, I'll give you a props here. I think. The mitochondriac manifesto, especially. Actually, I think the gut brain secrets is a no brainer. It's to help people truly understand where we're at today. I agree with you. You got to establish that foundation of truth and where our mistakes have been at and where we're at mm-hmm. today. But yeah, the mitochondriac manifesto is that's that's like, whew. yeah, <laughs> you need to understand the problems and uh, you under, need to understand the sources of the problems before you can start really unraveling all those problems and solving them. Yeah. Otherwise you're going to be going in all the wrong directions with uh, half truths and partial solutions that just keep you in fear, scarcity, and dependence. Yeah. I a la big, big pharma. Well, listen, we do have to bring this episode to a close because we got to stack the deck and get people pumped for part two. Um, so I, I, I wasn't going to use on this episode, but I do it with everybody. And I think it does make sense. So people truly understand, they listen to the whole first part one, and they want to understand more about Randy, so we're going to come back to part two. Besides digging deeper and ripping the lid off into a lot more detail, um, I've asked a lot of my co-hosts over the years is, you know, what's a legacy message of what you're trying to leave behind? Because again, you just hinted at here, right? Gut Brain Secrets was all about today. Mitochondriac Manifesto is for tomorrow. So one thing I've learned in the years of podcasting and starting my own charity and becoming an author was, like, why am I on this freaking planet, right? Like, what is a legacy that I would like to leave behind in this world? And because I think people need, do need to start thinking bigger than themselves. Uh, so is there anything that rings true in yourself that you want to help bring the episode to a close that actually symbolizes you as far as a legacy? Oh, gosh. Um, we are entering a new era of freedom and choice, where before we had none. We had to feed our energy into a broken system. And when you feed your energy into a broken system, you reinforce it. And previously, we had no choice. There was only a few options in the food supply. And uh, you will ha- we're entering a new era where, where you have choice, you have food choice, and you need to be more proactive and seek out the solutions and seek out the knowledge. I love that. Well, listen, hang and you, tight. And you will get better results. Yeah. Ha. Oh, there's a great, great final point. Better results? What? I'm all about that. Well, listen, hang tight. I want to give you a proper goodbye off the air. Ladies and gentlemen. Part one. We don't do a lot of multi-part episodes, so this should get you guys excited. All oh. right. There's just this is a big, big topic. We're gonna have a lot of more content coming your way on part two. And I promise you, I will not have it too spread out. I'll make sure these are released in a very close proximity to each other. So you're not having to wait a month or two months. All right. So uh, a reminder, ladies and gentlemen, we're here to fuel your health, your business, and your lifestyle. Randy Lee, the mital man himself. Part one is complete. Stay tuned for part two. And remember, you too can live the fuel. And we'll talk to you guys again soon.